Scripture today is Matthew 26, 14 to 25. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve disciples, and while he was eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Jesus, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. We are working our way toward the end of the book of Matthew. We've been going through this book for a while now. I'm not even sure when we started, but this is the the turning point here. And this is one that uh, you got to wonder about. Three years, Judas had walked with Jesus. Uh, Judas had even, along with Peter, declared Jesus as the Messiah. And then suddenly, he takes this turn and betrays him. Was it for the silver? I don't really think so. He was, uh, you know, many believe that he was in charge of the the finances and everything like that, but uh, I don't know if that was the the, the biggest driving point. Uh, We can only guess, truly, but educated guesses, uh, you know, the the gospel says that um, he was uh, overtaken by Satan. Uh, But even uh, when when I I believe that you are overtaken by that, uh, what happens is that you are convinced that what you're doing is right. You're convinced that your movement is justified. Uh, Many people do not do things just to be mean. They do things because they think that they are right. Uh, And that's where a lot of the delusion comes from. I think that Judas, he just didn't think that Jesus was moving fast enough. And he tried to control the narrative of who Christ was. Uh, That's what I believe. Uh, He wanted Jesus to cut to the chase. This is, have you heard this expression before, cut to the chase? It's when somebody's uh, talking and talking and talking, like when I'm talking and talking, Allison just says, would you cut to the chase? Um, This actually comes from silent movies. It's uh, a guy named Max Sennett was notorious for uh, silent slapstick, and he had chase scenes all the time, Keystone Cops, and he would say, cut to the chase. And that's where that term comes from. In this case, I believe that Jesus wanted, um, or Judas wanted Jesus to cut to the chase. He had been walking with him for three years, and he wanted to see some action. He wanted to see something happen. Um, give you an idea, an example here. I'm going to show you some videos here. Uh, this is just a very short clip of last week's sermon. I'll just show you that right there. They're one thing on the outside, and then they're on the inside, they're, you know, they're doing this, because they don't like what Jesus is doing. Okay, so that's just me talking, right? Now, some people that come to church or think that they haven't been to a church, uh, they, they, don't, they don't think it's that speed. They think it's more like this. They're one thing on the outside, That's Allison's favorite. She actually will watch some of my sermons that way because she says it sounds like I've had one too many. So. And then there are people that want this. The one thing on the outside, and then they're on the inside, you know, they're doing this because they don't like what Jesus is doing. And they actually talk about killing, killing people. But we, 
we tend to go at our own speed. And Jesus was one that went at his own speed. Judas, I believe, what he wanted was the warrior. He wanted that soldier that they had all thought. In the first century, when they talked about the Messiah, they did not uh, vision anything other than a descendant of King David, a warrior, somebody that would actually annihilate the Roman Empire and make Israel the kingdom again. Some of them, when they heard the words kingdom, they thought that they were talking about Israel, not the kingdom of heaven. And G Judas had been wanting this. He had been wanting this change, rightfully so. They'd been repressed. They, things had not happened good for them. He wanted something to happen. And then along comes Jesus, who they say is the Messiah, the chosen one. They think he talks about the kingdom happening. He talks about you know, the, the, all of this stuff happening now. So people like Judas are expecting this change. Maybe they have visions of, of, of finally taking up their arms. You know, it's not an unheard of thing. Even Peter thought about taking up arms. To them, that was the, def the def definition of change was power. And a lot of them thought that way. Jesus is at the table and he says, one of you betray me. Every single one of them was worried it was going to be them. Meaning that every single one of them might have had thoughts. So Judas, how does he cut to the chase? For three years... The, the, the message, the ministry of Jesus, they wanted it to be like this. But instead it was like this. Walking from village to village. Occasional miracle, you know. He'd, you know, walk on water for kicks, you know, but just, you know, you know. Casual, yeah. But most of the time, it was talking to people. Most of the time, it was going from village to village and having these conversations with someone they hadn't met yet. It was telling them about the kingdom. It was illustrating some stories. It was welcoming people. It was welcoming people that had not been welcomed before. But it wasn't a grandiose movement. There was no tearing down the walls. There was no uh, marching through the gates. Most of the time, for three years, it was one person at a time, talking, sharing stories, and loving them. I'm going to eat at your house tonight. And they'd go, and they'd eat dinner with them. So for Judas, who had spent his lifetime wanting this change, wanting to see Rome fall... How does he make that happen? Because it's too slow for him. It's just too slow. He wants production. He wants something big time. If, if I turn him over, it'll force his hand. Jesus won't cower to Rome. As soon as they try to take him, that's when he'll act. That's when the miracle will happen where he will take up arms and Rome will fall. It will force his hand and finally the gates of the kingdom will become one. This is a theory of what Judas was thinking. It's one that makes sense to me. If you want something to happen and you don't think it's happening fast enough, you try to speed things up. How surprised was he when he noticed at the table there that Judah, Ju Jesus was saying, somebody's going to betray me. And he didn't do a thing about it. He didn't say, it's you, Judas. Nah. Get out of here. He just said, it's going to happen. Passively submitting it's going to happen. That had to shock Judas from the start. 
is he kidding? Is this, you know, he's playing it like this, but as soon as, they, as soon as I do betray him, then he'll take up arms and he'll become that King David again. Because what it's about for Judas is the bells and the whistles. It's about the excitement. It's about the getting things going. And for three years, he's, all he has seen is this random acts of kindness. But he's not been seeing the Romans take over. He's even seen Jesus talking to centurions, Roman soldiers, the enemy. How's he going to force his hand on this? Yes. I hate to say it, but I think that I, I've betrayed Jesus just like Judas many times because there have been times where I've wanted the power. I, I've wanted to jump to that change, that solution. I, I, and so there's been times when I've been attracted to the, the shiny things. Let's look at our politics for, I hate to, I'm sorry, politics, but you, you, you cannot watch a, um, a, a political rally without smoke machines, without lights and lasers and big announcements, you know, and people, instead of talking about the, the things that they want to do, they talk about the, the people that are against them and that we will, we will annihilate them. We will not let this happen. The debates are all about, you got to put a stop to this. Oh, they would have spoke so well to Judas's audience. He would have been attracted to that because they were actually talking about uh, persecution, about harming, about punishing the enemy. But for three years, Jesus never, never did that. Could you imagine Jesus at a political debate? He'd be laughed off the stage because he would not talk about people in, an, in a negative term. He would not tell us that we need to fear people that are different than us. He talked about loving your enemy. He talked about breaking bread with people. He, he talked about being friends with everyone. He talked about everybody being welcomed. Pardon me. Do my, I do my own stunts sometimes. Churches are the same way. There's a lot of churches that are, oh, they, their budget uh, gets spent on huge production. Uh, they, lights and smoke and... Uh, all, you know, just big bands and the, the, the video and all of that kind of stuff to where your, your eyes don't rest for a moment and you feel this, this powerful moment. Judas would have liked that too because it would have been talking about change. And, and some unfortunate churches uh, use their, their, um, their message of Jesus and they morph it in a way that means... I. I get to kick this person out of the kingdom. I get to judge this person. I get to not like this person. This person's our enemy. This person's a threat. We will persecute. We will punish. I, I think Judas might have liked that because it, it would have talked about action. But for three years, Jesus never taught that where Judas wanted a race to the finish line. Jesus walked. He didn't carry a, a, a band with him. He, he didn't go into a town and spend the first day setting up the stage and all of this kind of stuff, you know. His miracles weren't magic tricks to perform. They were acts of kindness to invite. I'm not sure Judas got that. I'm not sure that he understood that the things that he was hoping for were happening. You know, oftentimes we want to just jump and cut to the chase. We want to jump from, from here in our life to there in our life. 
We see a goal. We, gotta, we just want to do it. Jesus is about the journey, about walking, about every single person that he meets along the way. I think Judas missed out on that because Judas just wanted to see that thing. He wasn't seeing the here and now. He wasn't living in that moment. He wanted the power. He wanted the excitement. You know, we have an air show that's going on uh, that's affecting traffic. You know, like I said, there's, there's people that will not see the north side of town until probably November because of traffic is just so uh, backed up. We look up in the skies and we see this power. We see this symbol. It's loud. It shakes the house. You feel this moment of awe. But I believe that the true, the true moments of peace, they, they come not from uh, the plane's power, but of maybe the people sharing a, a ride to watch the show. Maybe the conversations along the way. Maybe the conversations on the way home. You know, the ones where you go, I can't hear a word you're saying. Can you, can you live in that, in that journey? Can we pause long enough to experience the Christ moments without the big change? Can we trust in Christ for the individual moments rather than throw everything that we have in our beliefs just to a person that says that he will take care of it? by giving us permission to fear and hate somebody else. Do we want that power or do we want the true power of Jesus? That power comes slowly, patiently. The reason that Jesus was here three years, he didn't want to miss a moment. He didn't want to miss a conversation with somebody. He didn't, he didn't want to miss talking to somebody. He did it for three years, and he's been doing it for 2,000. We might want that change right away, but we are missing. We are missing the signs that it's already happening. Just by talking to each other. Just by sharing a meal together. A hero of mine said, it's not about the shallow and complex. It's about the deep and the simple. Our church is based on the deep and simple. We, we don't have, you know, the most exciting thing that we get is if Will gets new shoes. <laughs> but we do have the message of Christ here. We do have that loving moments. We do have that deep and simple conversation. And we relish it. We take the time to enjoy the blessings. I hope that we do that. When you can speed on the way home, I invite you to slow down and see around you. Ignore them. <laughs> this message of love, it's aimed over here. <laughs> I pray, uh, I'm serious, I, I pray. <laughs> I pray that today uh, we take the time to walk the walk, to not cut to the chase, but to actually sit and enjoy the journey. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we pray that you are with us. Remind us that you are not just at the end, but you are every step of the way. Remind us to pause, to take moments, to experience the blessings in our life, to experience people in our community, 
to experience the love of you. Help us to take time to truly spend time loving you, to learn more how to love ourselves and to learn more how to love our neighbor, which is truly everyone. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen.